So I'm going to be talking today a little bit about, I, I unfortunately wasn't here for some of the other talks that some of you probably were here for this morning. I heard they were really good. Uh, for the most part, you've heard a lot about dinosaur tracks. And, you know, probably like every kid who's interested in paleontology, I was interested in dinosaurs to begin with. Um, and just to give you a quick overview, or not really an overview, but just a quick uh, additional bit of information about me. Like every other kid who was interested in paleo, I wanted to do dinosaurs. And I started off in paleontology at UMass uh, Amherst working on dinosaur tracks. And I've transitioned, as Sarah said, into working on insects within the last five years. And I would never have thought that I wanted to do that ever in a million years. And I'm now finding that it's really, really fun. Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons probably to do this is simply because dinosaurs didn't live in a vacuum. So I'm sitting at my kitchen table and I can look out into my backyard right now, you know, and there's, you know, there are animals out there, like the neighbor's cat sitting in the sun right now. You know, those are the big animals that live around here today. But there are insects crawling in the grass. There are worms in the soil. You know, there are birds in the trees. There are the trees and the grass uh, themselves. So these animals uh, that were interested in the big, you know, sharp teeth, sharp clawed things, you know, they're not the only things and they wouldn't exist in a vacuum by themselves. They lived in an ecosystem full of lots of other things. And so, you know, to get a complete picture of what was going on in our region, and I'm putting some air quotes there because I'm not geographically where you are anymore, but, you know, in Western Mass and Connecticut, you know, that region was full of lots of other things. And there was so much more going on than just the dinosaurs that were running around. So I've now found that studying these insect tracks is absolutely fascinating because it fills in the picture a little bit more about what was going on at that time. That doesn't mean I don't, I don't work on dinosaur tracks anymore. I certainly do when I get the chance to, but I'm really interested in working on these insects right now. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time dealing with that uh, today. And I do wanna say that, so I put this lecture together originally for a, col a college audience. Um, that said, you don't need to worry about that. I mean, there might be some terminology and things like that on the slides that maybe you don't know, I would recommend not worrying about that because I generally try to make sure that I explain things in a way that uh, will be clear to people who don't have all that jargon. Uh, but anyway, so, and obviously, you know, please feel free to ask questions during the Q&A at the end. I will do my absolute best to try to make sure we have plenty of time in case anybody's just itching to ask a question, okay? All right, so with that said, let's take a look at some things here. But I wanna start off with, and, and forgive me if I'm redundant, because again, I wasn't here this morning to see what you folks saw earlier. I like to start off very, very basic and work my way into what we're gonna be talking about. So let's start off with what are trace fossils, okay? And trace fossils are any kind of sedimentary structure that is made by a living organism. And that's a key feature of trace fossils. So, they're made by living organisms, whether those organisms be animals or plants. Believe it or not, yes, plants can make trace fossils. Okay, we're not gonna worry about that for now. That's maybe a great opportunity for a question later on. So things like tracks, you know, like dinosaur tracks, things like trails made by an animal dragging a tail, or a burrow dug by some animal. Uh, those are all considered sedimentary structures and they are considered trace fossils, okay? There is, it's not really a gray area. I was actually discussing this with somebody the other day, but sometimes the animals leave body imprints when they're dead, but that's technically a body fossil. So here we have this thing on the bottom here. It looks, I don't know, it looks sort of like a log. It's actually not a log at all. It's, it's a little burrow made by a beetle that was sort of digging around in the sediment a little over 200 million years ago in what is now Virginia. And those little marks that you see on it, are, those are scratches by the legs, okay? So this is a trace fossil. And here we have a trackway made by an insect as well. This is also a trace fossil. I'm just gonna throw a little plug in right here for these particular ones on the top. Uh, most people, and you folks are not an exception to this, are familiar with the dinosaur and other tracks from Western Massachusetts and Connecticut. 
I'm willing to bet that very few, if any of you, are actually aware that there are tracks of animals that are 115 mil million years older than those dinosaur tracks in eastern Massachusetts, okay? In the region where, you know, sort of like where Foxborough Stadium is, if you're a, if you're a, um, a Patriots fan. Uh, and this is one of those tracks. This is an insect trackway that's 315 million years old. So 115 million years before the dinosaurs were running around in Western Mass, okay? So anyway, there's actually quite a few trace fossils in Massachusetts. All right, but those are trace fossils. Now, some other trace fossils include gastroliths and coprolites. Gastroliths are stones that are swallowed by uh, animals for a variety of different reasons. One is they might, uh, you know, swallow these stones to help grind up their food. And here's a, a close-up of an animal called Protoceratops. No, this is actually Cetacosaurus, excuse me. Um, and this particular animal has a whole, it was found with a whole bunch of stones in its stomach. And these stones, we see animals do this today. They swallow stones and those stones are, are basically um, mixed around with the food by muscles in the stomach region to help grind up the food. So that's probably what this dinosaur was actually eating those stones for, not to get nutrients out, but probably to grind up the plants that it ate. And coprolites are exactly what they look like. They look like fossilized poop. And that's exactly what they are, okay? These are considered trace fossils as well. They're deposited by an animal after food goes through uh, the digestive system. And they're extremely useful because they can tell you, if you can match them up with an animal, they can tell you what that animal ate. You can cut them up and, and look at them under a microscope. You're like, oh, look at these fish scales, for example. And you can say, ah, this particular animal is eating fish, okay? Anyway, so these are some trace fossils. Oop, there we go. And so the study of trace fossils is called ichnology, ichnology, which is often confused with ichthyology, right? The study of fish, okay? The study of fish. This is a really cool piranha here at the Dallas Aquarium. It's one of the first places I went when I moved here three years ago. Uh, really, really great place. Unfortunately, no one's going anywhere these days with the, I shouldn't say that entirely, but with the pandemic. But um, so don't confuse these two, ichthyology and ichnology. Ichnology is the study of trace fossils, okay? And why should we study trace fossils? So when I was a kid, and right up until when I went to college at UMass, I was more interested in dinosaur body fossils, their skeletons. I couldn't give a hoot about trace fossils. So it, it, they were meaningless to me in the sense that I'm like, they're not, they're not the interesting, the cool, exciting things, like a, a skull with sharp teeth in it. That's what's cool, that's what's exciting, that's what everybody wants to talk about. That's what you see on Discovery Channel, right? Well, one of the primary reasons to study trace fossils is that they are direct evidence, okay? Direct evidence of the behavior of animals, all right? And so they can be used to figure out what an animal is doing at the time that it was alive. Now, the only other way to figure these things out is by indirect observation. So, okay, sure, we know that Tyrannosaurus rex was eating meat. I mean, it's obvious when you look at its sharp teeth, right? But what exactly was it eating? Was it eating Triceratops? Was it eating, you know, who knows what, right? Uh, you know, when you find, for example, a coprolite, a Tyrannosaurus rex coprolite, there is one that has been discovered and it's chock full of dinosaur bone, primarily hadrosaur bone, and if I remember right, some ceratopsian bone. That is direct evidence for what Tyrannosaurus ate. You know, you can't say for sure without looking at, um, you know, the trace fossils. All you can say is that, okay, it's got sharp teeth, well, it ate meat, okay? And the other reason to study trace fossils is that sometimes they are the only fossils available because of what are called preservational biases. And I'll talk about those in a second. I just wanna point this out. These are 500 million year old trace fossils that are called climactic nites. And this was made, or these were made by animals that are entirely soft body. There's literally no skeleton to them. They're basically a giant slug-like animal. And there's no body fossils 
that have ever been preserved because it's basically a, it's a pile of goo, right? It's just muscle and tissue. And then when the animal dies, it completely decomposes and leaves nothing left behind. We would never know anything about these animals at all if we didn't have their trails left behind, right? So trace fossils are incredibly valuable for studying uh, paleontology for these two reasons. And I'll just mention again, I wasn't interested at all. And it took me at least a year, maybe even a little bit longer to finally get to the point where I was like, yeah, this is fun. I like this, okay? And hopefully you folks come away today with the idea that trace fossils are actually pretty cool, pretty exciting, and they're, they're even better than body fossils, or at least on par anyway. All right, so let me give you an example of preservational bias just so that you understand what I mean. And I'm gonna focus very specifically, uh, very specifically on the region that you and I are from. So dinosaur bones are really rare in the Hartford and Deerfield basins, which is, a, those, are, those two basins are roughly equivalent to the Connecticut River Valley. Okay, so there's very, very few dinosaur bones. There are some, but there are few, okay? And there are also dinosaur bone molds occasionally found. This is a set of molds that were found in the 19th century that had been published on, and I talked a little bit about them in a paper, Gideon Bush 2011. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these in a second. But what these molds show is that it's, you know, I did this study, and I'll probably talk about this in a few minutes here, that these bones were probably buried and decomposed underground. Bones decompose underground all the time. The overwhelming majority of people who've ever lived, there's no evidence for their existence because over centuries, their bones completely just decompose as well. The same thing is true of dinosaurs. So we live in a region where there are very few dinosaur skeletons. If there were no trace fossils, we wouldn't know anything about these dinosaurs or very little about them. So we're lucky that we have these trace fossils because the environment in which they live was not, uh, was not conducive to, to producing skeletal material by and large. So I just wanna zoom in on one of these bones and I'm not really sure what this actually is. I had argued at one point or another that this was probably a partial neck vertebra. Could be, maybe not, I don't know. That's really not the point. The point here is if you look at the, the texture of the rock, the texture of the rock is basically sand, and you can see that the bone is all sand too. There is no actual bone there. This is unusual. So these bones are gone, and there's just sand that filled in the holes left behind to preserve the imprint of the bones. This is a lot like the way that, that trace fossils are preserved in many cases. Now, there are a couple of ways these bolds, these, uh, these bolds, these molds could have formed. One, which had been argued in the past, was that the bone sat in some mud, fast moving water pulled the bone out and dumped sand in its place. The sand then filled in the hole left by the bones. And ultimately, when you split the sand from the mud, you have the imprint of, of the, or the, the imprint in the sand. Yep, what's going on here? There we go. All right, uh, another possibility is that the bone lay in the mud, fast moving water carrying the sand basically dumped on top of the bone, and then the bone decomposed and the sand just filled in where the, where the bone was left behind. Now, it's hard to say I wasn't there, you know, 200 million years ago to say which really happened. Uh, I tend to, pre uh, to prefer this bottom hypothesis for various reasons. And I'll just show a couple of them really quickly here. Uh, I'll just show one of them, actually. I did some cross sections of the bones and blah, blah. And we can see that there are these big mud rims and various things that I argued probably wouldn't exist if a fast moving current was sweeping right across the surface. So I thought that, well, the bones were in place, mud was on top of them, and the sand just filled in, leaving these little mud rims uh, as the bones slowly decomposed. If that's in fact correct, it's a big if, I know, and some people think that I'm right and some people think that I'm probably wrong and that's okay. Uh, but if I'm right, that explains why there are so very few bones. 
And there are some other possibilities why there are very few bones, but the bottom line is there are very, very few bones in, in our region, the, the, in Connecticut and Massachusetts, okay? Anyway, we'll, we'll not worry about all the rest of this. So I say that's wrong. All right, so how does this work? How did that ultimately happen? And I know that this is a big aside, but it's actually worth getting to. So, so bone is made up of this uh, mineral phase called hydroxyapatite. We don't need to worry really too much about that. I'm not gonna give you a quiz at the end of this, okay? But hydroxyapatite is soluble, which means it dissolves in acid, okay? Even little, little tiny little bits of acid, right? Now, there was probably acidity in that region, just like there's acid rain today, and the acid resulted from a variety of different things. So decomposition is one. Everything that decomposes produces organic acids, okay? And there was possibly acid rain going on at that time, very likely to be acid rain going on at that time because there's massive volcanism going on that's dumping tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, okay? Lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide mixes with uh, water to form carbonic acid. And it rains down and it percolates through the mud and the sand and it dissolves stuff that's in it, okay? We're not gonna worry about all that. I know there's a lot of text on here sometimes. All right, anyway. So let's go uh, move past that and talk about trace fossils and how trace fossils are preserved because it's different than the way body fossils are preserved. Trace fossils in general are not subject to dissolution. They don't dissolve. They're just an imprint. They're not made up of minerals themselves, okay? They're just a hole in the ground in the case of dinosaur tracks or insect tracks, which is what I'm gonna to get to in a minute. And they usually require soft, sticky substrates like mud that then harden. The hardened material then gets filled in and eventually through compaction and cementation, which are the two general processes that produce sedimentary rocks, the trace fossil is preserved. These two tracks, by the way, are on display at Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill. Uh, if you haven't been to Rocky Hill, it's a great place to go uh, check out some really cool dinosaur tracks, as are all the other fantastic places, places in the region. All right, so now let's start getting to uh, this, this sort of like the, the, the important part of the, the topic that I was going to talk about today, insects and insect tracks. So at the time, the dinosaurs were leaving their footprints in the Connecticut River Valley. There was a major, major radiation going on. So an explosion of diversity, okay, an explosion of diversity, where insects, which had lived in, and I know these are some fancy words here, lacustrine just means lake, Entomofauna, fauna means just like animals, and entomo, like entomology, insect, you know, grouping of insects. So at this particular time, there was this development of uh, a, you know, a group of insects that were going to start living in lakes. Before that, insects either lived on land or they lived in rivers, but for the most part, they really weren't living in lakes. Okay. In the late Triassic period, I'm going to draw this blue line here. This is the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, all right? And basically going into the Jurassic period, which is when the rocks, uh, where most of the rocks are from in our region, the Connecticut River Valley, what we see is that there's a bunch of like, aquatic heteroptera, right? We'll talk about what those are in a minute. Aquatic coleoptera, aquatic, you know, living in lakes, okay? Uh, and various other things. Let's see, diptera, flies, including flies that live in lakes, at least sometimes, or, or reproduce near lakes or whatever. So the development of, you know, this grouping of insects that live in lakes starts in the late Triassic and into the early Jurassic period, right at the time that the dinosaurs are running around in our region. Again, it results from the diversification of three groups of insects. We've got the heteroptera, Okay, um, we'll talk about again what the heteroptera are in a minute. Those are basically the true bugs. We've got the coleoptera, which are the beetles, and the diptera, which are the flies. Okay, and on a worldwide basis, this development, this major evolutionary development, is primarily recorded by body fossils. And there are some of these body fossils in, in uh, our region. 
okay? Marmalocoides is one of them. And this black smear right there, there's another partial smear right there, it's just cut off, and there's a third one right there. Those are insect larvae, probably beetle larvae that lived in the lakes. But by and large, besides this particular larva, and it's not entirely clear exactly what type, of beetle it's from because they're not well pres preserved, okay? So besides these beetle larvae, there's very little evidence in our neck of the woods of this major development in life history, right? There's not a lot going on in terms of body fossils nearby, for, probably for the same reason that there aren't many dinosaur tracks, excuse me, uh, dinosaur skeletons, simply because the environments were not right for the preservation Right, for the preservation of body fossils of dinosaurs or of insects. But there are some insects preserved. Here's a, an aquatic beetle from Virginia. So it's a little bit older than the, the rocks in, in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Here's, um, it's what's called a giant water bug. Right, you've probably seen these, if you own a pool yourself, you've probably seen these. Okay. They are, uh, they can get really, really big and they're predators. And there's, here's also a, a fly, a particular type of fly. All of these again are from, from Virginia. So really nice body fossils in Virginia that are a little bit older than ours uh, are, are, you know, fossil bearing rocks. But we don't have a lot of this stuff in, in the Hartford and Deerfield basins. Well, that's unfortunate. So again, what, what I said earlier, one of the reasons to justify the study of trace fossils is because they, they can provide evidence for animals when there are no animal body fossils around. So these trace fossils supplement the body fossil record. Okay? Here is a trackway at the uh, Bineski Museum of Amherst, at Amherst College showing a bunch of insect trackways uh, on it. There were insects walking across this when it was soft mud. And these indentations here, by the way, are the tips of dinosaur tracks, the toes of dinosaur tracks. These are the claws right here. So we have insects crawling around, you know, on surfaces that were inhabited by dinosaurs as well, right? The dinosaurs and the insects uh, co you know, coexisted. So before I get into any more details of specifics about the, the trace fossils, I just want to, you know, again, you probably heard this this morning, but very briefly summarize what's going on at this point in time in New England, right? So Pangaea had formed in the latest Carboniferous into the Permian period, and then by the late Triassic, it starts to pull apart. And it continues to pull apart in the early Jurassic period. As all these continents are pulling apart from each other, massive valleys form as the crust thins. And the remnants of these valleys can be seen, you know, again, in our region today uh, in sort of this light sort of reddish brown color that I've uh, got for you here. And the blood, so that's representing the sedimentary rocks that are left behind. And the black represents uh, igneous rocks. So volcanic rocks and uh, intrusive igneous rocks. So we have the Hartford Basin, which basically goes from about Amherst all the way down to Long Island Sound from uh, basically this region, Amherst, all the way up to here in about uh, Deerfield is the, the Deerfield Basin. And then we've got the uh, Northfield Basin, that tiny little sliver there, the Pump Rock Basin, there's the Cherry Brook Basin, that tiny little sliver there. Anyway, all right, so these rocks are basically from the time, from the time frame that insects were invading the lakes. And what's interesting also is that these lakes, right, these lakes, well, excuse me, these lakes, uh, this region was full of lakes, but there's big holes in the ground, right? There's big holes in the ground. These valleys are gigantic and water is going to fill them. So we just happen to have a big hole in the ground in our region that the dinosaurs are running through. It fills with water. And so if, you know, if there is this major radiation of insects into lakes, and we've got lakes in the region, we should have trace fossils of insects crawling around. And just as a quick uh, Where's Waldo moment here, I want to just point out by this art by um, Will Sillen, there's a dinosaur right there crawl, running across a, uh, or walking across a, a lava flow. 
All right, anyway, there it is. Now the lakes rise and fall as a result of climate forcing. So we see basically red rocks in various different places. Um, and these red rocks represent deposition in drying lakes. And you have darker colors, the, the grays ultimately to the almost blacks. There's no blacks here, but these represent high stands of the lakes where the lakes are relatively permanent. They don't dry up every season, okay? But there are lakes in this, in this area. And so one should expect there to be trace fossils of aquatic insects in these, fossil, in these rocks. <coughs> Again, the insects themselves, other than Marmolacoides, that beetle larva I showed you a minute ago, they're very, very rare. And the body fossils that we do have are fragmentary, mostly wings. And these are the, the wing covers, actually. They're called elytra. These are wing covers for beetles. Okay. There are a few other things, uh, but there's not much. That said, their trace fossils are incredibly abundant. Okay, They're incredibly abundant. They were first described by Edward Hitchcock in the 19th century. I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, have heard about Edward Hitchcock by now. If you were in some of the earlier talks, I mean, the, he's been introduced, I would imagine. And here's just one of these trace fossils here called Bifurcula pest laqueatus. That will be on the quiz that I said I wasn't going to give you in a minute. Okay. Now let's talk about, so how do we identify swimming insect trackways? Well, swimming insect trackways are probably going to look different than the trackways of walking insects. So let's then start with what walking insect trackways would look like. And this doesn't apply to all insects, but it applies to the overwhelming majority of them. It applies to a group of insects called the pterygotes. Pterygote just means winged insect, okay? Uh, there are insects that do not have wings. We're not gonna worry about those for now. Now, winged insects typically walk, and actually some uh, non-winged insects also do this. They walk with a, a, a gate called um, the arthropod stance, the hexagonal gate. Uh, there's various different uh, terms for it. The tripodal stance is another one. So here's a, uh, I'm a, it's a beetle. And what we see is that three of the legs are filled in in black and three are in white. They're just not filled in at all. The ones that are filled in black are the ones that are basically going to be um, the ones that are moving. So we'll see that insects always have three legs of their six legs on the ground at any given point in time. So three legs are on the ground, three are moving. And that produces very distinctive trackways. That's what we see right here. There's a beetle crossing a sand dune. Very, very distinctive trackways are left by these. What we see is that there are sets of tracks and each of these sets has one, two, three foot imprints in it. That's the first leg, here's our second leg, and there's the third leg. And the first leg always points slightly forward, the second leg, its foot, if we can call it that, we'll use that term for now, uh, points uh, perpendicular to the trackway, and then the back leg points backward, okay? And so we can see this, and there's one there, we've got one, two, and three. And we just, you know, there's this alternating left and right, left and right, left and right of these sets of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, just like that. As long as this insect keeps walking, that's what it's going to produce, okay? Now, there are lots and lots and lots of insect trackways in our neck of the woods that show that typical hexapod gait. This is one of them here. This is uh, Gramipus. Let's take a quick look at it. We're gonna zoom in on that. Here's the trackway in close up. There's one of the sets. There's foot number one, number, the imprint of foot number two, and the imprint of foot number three. There's another set over here. There's one, two, and three. So this is your typical walking insect. Okay, this is your typical walking insect. And there's yet another one here. So we got lots and lots of walking insect trackways in the Hartford and Deerfield basins. All right, we'll just see those there. There's another set, one, two, and three. And you'll notice again, they're alternating left, right, left, right, left, right, okay? Very typical of what we just saw. 
So no one would argue that these are insects walking around most likely on land. Now I wanna to get to the topic of today after all that background information, but it was worth it, I think. So are there any aquatic insect trackways that would represent that entoma fauna? And I argue that there probably are some trackways. So let's take a look. Not all of these trackways, a lot of them actually do not show the typical hexapod gait. One is what is called Bifurcula pest laqueatus, and it has a very unusual trackway pattern. Here's a fossil of it right there. This is the, the whole trackway. There's a zoomed in portion of it there, and this is a tracing of what it looks like. This does not have, it does show the, the left, right, left, right alternating pattern, but the tracks are in a very different arrangement than they are in, for example, the other things that we're looking at, okay? The, the other ones we're looking at in the last slides. This does not look like your typical walking insect trackway, all right? Now, what's interesting, so I argue that, well, okay, yeah, these probably could be, you know, doing something else, but I don't know, and so I left it alone for a while. And then within the last uh, year, I published a really short paper where I was suggesting that, um, no, these probably are, in fact, swimming trackways, and let me tell you why I think they are. So these are three trackways, two of which are at the Amherst College Museum, and one is at the Yale Peabody Museum. The bottom one is at Yale. Each of these trackways, and I know they're hard to see, but they take a zigzag pattern across the slab. That's what the tracings show here, the zigzag pattern of these insects going across that slab, okay? Now, what's interesting about the zigzag is that parts of those zigzagging trackways parallel these little things that look like tiny little ripple marks, but they're not ripple marks. You can see these faint grooves and uh, ridges on these slabs. And these arrows, these double arrows, are pointing in the direction of these grooves and, and, and ridges. You can see them running across here and running across here. These are what are called current lineations, current lineations. They're formed in really, really fast flowing water. Okay, they're formed in flat, fast flowing water. And it's really interesting that these trackways take turns that parallel the current lineations. It's strongly suggestive that these animals are actually moving either with or against a current. So they're probably interacting with flowing water. It's not 100% because again, I wasn't there. Uh, there conceivably could be other explanations for this. I don't know for sure. Um, I couldn't come up with any. That doesn't mean there aren't any. But anyway, let's see. We've got Yeah, I, I do see the, the Q&As. Um, I, my thought was to keep them until the very end, if that's okay. Hopefully. That's fine. Okay, yeah, all right. Just because I just want to make sure that I get through everything. So uh, I will not forget, uh, I did see that. All right, anyway, so I think this trackway or this, this fossil, there's lots of them, are uh, basically these insects swimming around, okay? Now, there's another fossil called Lunilipes obscurus, and this one is even more convincing. So this particular trackway, and the name Lunilipes means little moon-like feet, okay? And the, the individual tracks are shaped like little crescent moons. That's where it gets its name from, okay? What's interesting, well, there's a couple of, I think there's a lot of things that are interesting about it. But anyway, this is a, a tracing of what the trackway looked like. This is probably made by, I would imagine, Ora White Hitchcock, um, Edward Hitchcock's wife. So we have these really cool uh, little moon shaped tracks all sort of lined up in two different rows. Now, actually, let me go back for a second. Edward Hitchcock thought they were made by a myriapod. Myriapods are uh, arthropods like the, um, the millipedes and the centipedes. And Hitchcock thought they were made by them because, you know, well, they're all in a row like this and you can't really make out, you know, sets of tracks like you do with insects. Well, it turns out since Hitchcock's day, 
we've actually, you know, observed, and I'm surprised he didn't do this himself because he was really keen on, you know, getting animals to make tracks and sort of, he did a little bit of experimenting on his own. But we know what myriapod tracks look like now. This is um, a, a very large, for our region, millipede. I collected some of these when I was hiking one day when I was still living in Connecticut and I had them cross uh, pans of mud. And their tracks don't look anything like Lineal Pest Obscurus. They're basically in wet mud anyway. They're just two big old grooves. Okay, and we've see, we see fossils that look a lot like this. So uh, these are not, these fossils, Lineal Pest Obscurus, that is not a myriapod trackway. So what's, and this is, oh, I just, I absolutely love this trackway, I adore it. So what we see is again, there are parallel rows right here made up of single tracks, one in front of the other, and then on opposite, and then on the other side of the trackway, there's a paired track, okay? And so they're not left, right, left, right, like other insect trackways or other arthropod trackways, they're right across from each other almost as if an animal is hopping. But I don't think there's hopping going on either. What this is suggesting to me is that the animal is using one set of legs and it's is beating the legs in unison. It's beating the legs in unison. And it just so happens that there are tons of, of aquatic insects today that do that. Okay, so uh, this is a figure from uh, a, a paper that a, a former student and I put together after some experiments. This is what is called a, a, a back swimmer, notonectidae. We don't need to worry about the fancy name there, a back swimmer. And they have a single set of legs that they use for swimming. And they have other sets of legs that are used for grasping their prey. Then we have uh, th this group here, the Carixidae. These are the water boatmen, which again, you swim with a single set of elongate legs that have a big old paddle at the end. And this is a group, this is a group of aquatic beetles called the Dytisidae, the um, predaceous diving beetles, that again use a set of legs for swimming. They beat that, they spread them out and they kick them both at the same time. So these are three possible makers for lunity pests. And, and this student, Sam Loeb and I did some experiments to see if we could figure out which ones it might be. Now, I just wanna point out, you've probably seen these. You've probably seen these. Uh, if you own a pool or if you've ever gone swimming in a lake, you've probably seen these because they get into your pools if you don't take good enough care to, to keep them really, really highly chlorinated. Um, I had a couple in mind this summer. And they also, again, they're, they're all over in lakes. But anyway, all right, so here are some students when I was currently, or, or not currently, but when I was at the University of Connecticut, we ha I had some students back in 2015 work with me and we were doing some experiments. We basically got some insects from the local ponds and we would put them into these pans that had mud at the bottom and it was filled with just a little bit of water on top. And we'd put the insects in, make them swim around and see what kind of tracks they would make. Okay, that's what we would do. And here's just the pan from the side to see that, you know, there's the mud. And we did really, really shallow water here, just a couple of millimeters. And we deliberately made them swim in very shallow water so that these insects would deliberately have to touch the bottom. We wanted them to touch the bottom to ensure that they would make trackways, okay? We didn't want them swimming around up in the water for you know, all day long and not ever leave a trackway because then we wouldn't have any experimental results to talk about. So let's look at our results. So back swimmers swim upside down, just like the name suggests. And they have a big keel on their back. And there's those legs that you use for kicking and swimming. Here are the legs that are used for grasping their prey. And they made these weird trackways that had the back impressed all the time. And this is unlike Lunili Pest. So we're like, well, we did a couple of experimental trials. One produced this trackway. And we're like, well, this looks nothing like Lunili Pest. So we kind of moved on. 
Then we tried the predaceous diving beetles because they seem really, really promising. And by the way, I mean, you can see how small some of these are. Here's, you know, the insect. There's a penny for scale, okay? All right. So they look promising because again, they have these legs that spread out and they just kick those legs back. Here's what their trackways look like. They're experimental trackways. They're similar in some ways to lineal pests. You can see the crescentic tracks here, but in front of all the crescentic tracks, there are these smaller tracks, like we see on opposite sides here between the other sets of crescentic ones. So here's a crescentic one, small one, crescentic one, small one, crescent, small, crescent, small. So they're actually kicking with two sets of legs, which is not like lineally pest, not like the fossil. Okay, those are the rear legs, the big crescent ones. And those are one of the sets of anterior legs that are leaving the smaller ones. Water boatmen also seem promising. And it turns out their trackways were the most like lineally pests of any of them, uh, excuse me, any of them all. So here are the crescentic tracks in the trackways, all right? And there's nothing in between. There's no extra sets of footprints that would suggest that the animals are swimming with multiple sets of legs. This is the most like lunely pests uh, of any of the sets of animals that we experimented with. We actually experimented with other insects as well. We're not gonna get into that for sake of time. Oh, actually, I guess we are really quickly. I forgot I had this slide in here. All right, this is a small uh, version. It's probably a, a subadult uh, of uh, one of the um, giant water bugs. So giant water bugs, there are the legs that are used for grasping prey. These things are really nasty. They can pinch you really good uh, and they can bite as well. And here there are two sets of legs used for swimming and I'll be darned if they use two sets for swimming, you will find two sets of tracks. Here's the rear legs very lunely pest-like, but there's a set of anterior legs that leave imprints as well, okay? So we're not dealing with a giant water bug. We're vote most likely based on the, the groups of insects we dealt with, we're dealing with a water boatman or something very similar. One other type is what is called a whirly gig. I'm sure you've seen these before if you've ever gone out by a stream in the summer they too leave double sets of tracks. So we've got the rear legs and the anterior legs there. So it's not a whirly gig. The fossils are not made by whirly gigs either. Okay. All right. So our argument in our paper, Sam's and my paper, was that, you know, Lunili Pest, the fossil, was either made by a water boatman or something very, very similar to a water boatman. And to move on from there for just now, I just want to mention there's yet another. So I just, I'm just going to say, I think it's pretty convincing based on these swimming trackways of various different insects that we experimented with, that lunely pest is an aquatic insect trackway. It's still up in the air exactly what made it, but what made it is very likely to either be a water boatman or a water boatman like insect. And there's one other possibility that I'm entertaining right now for swimming insects. And this is the trackway called Acanthicnus, and very specifically, uh, Acanthicnus saltatorius. What's interesting about that particular one, and I can annotate here, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that, or can I? Oh, I can, perfect. So the animal is moving, in this case, from the right to the left and down here from the left to the right. Now what's interesting about these trackways is that the animal's tracks are not parallel to the trackway axis. You would expect if you're walking or moving, you know, from left to right like this, your tracks should be oriented in the direction that you're moving. But all the tracks are oriented at an angle to the direction the animal's moving. That's really weird. Why would an animal orient its feet on an angle to the direction it's actually moving? You, know, you can see the same thing here. These tracks are all oriented at an angle to the direction the animal's moving. Why would an animal do that? Well, 
one of the again that one of the interesting things that we kind of see with this particular set of tracks is that in some of them the animals taking these interesting zigzaggy sorts of turns just like bifurculopes and some of these tracks are oriented parallel to the direction the animal is moving at specific points in time and all of this is strongly suggesting that these animals again are are swimming and fighting a current Okay, so I think that this is an animal, again, that is fighting a current. And this is analogous, let me bring you back to dinosaurs for just a second. This is analogous to what was seen in some dinosaur tracks from Spain. So let me go ahead and annotate one more time here. Where did that go? Here we go. So with this dinosaur trackway from Spain, I think it's Cretaceous, the animal's moving from the bottom of the image up to the top. And what we see is that some of the tracks on one side of the trackway are at a very high angle to the direction the animal's moving. The other set are actually parallel to the animal's direction of motion. Okay. Now, what geologists figured out is that there's, by looking at the various different sedimentary structures, is that there's actually a current, or there was, I should say, going that direction. And the animal wanted to swim in, an, in, an, uh, in a direction that was oblique to the current. And in order to stay on a straight path and not be swept away the, by, by the current, the animal had to kick at an angle with one set of legs to make sure that it stayed on the path that it wanted to do. And this is, you know, at least a good, you know, suggestion for what might actually be going on with something like Akin Thickness with its zigzagging trackways. Now there's more research that needs to be done on my part, but this is at least my working hypothesis about what's going on. So let me go ahead and summarize what we've talked about so far. And I got a little bit of time here, so, all right. Lakes were invaded by insects in the late Triassic and early Jurassic period. That's the time frame that our, that our rocks in, in Southern New England uh, actually preserve, you know, evidence of, okay? So those rocks are of that age. And not only that, they are, at least some of the rocks, a lot of the rocks are lake rocks, full of insect tracks. We would expect then some aquatic insect trackways. And there are at least some that do show evidence of that. Bifurculopes, Lacquiatus, pretty strong evidence. You know, although maybe you're not convinced, that's okay, we can talk about that. Another that I think is really convincing is Lunilipes obscurus. Okay, and then possibly Akin thickness there. And so, well, who cares? Who cares? And what are some of the possible implications of this? I mean, there's, there's others. Again, one of the things I started off with saying earlier was that, well, it fills in information, it fills in gaps you know, in what's going on. Again, dinosaurs didn't live in a vacuum. Everybody focuses on the dinosaurs, but the dinosaurs didn't live in a vacuum. What else was living? You know, these dinosaurs, the carnivorous ones anyway, they're at the top of the food chain. What else is going on? What else is around to help fill out that food chain? Well, these other trackways tell us. All right, and so some other implications are that all these different types of trace fossils can be used as a proxy, meaning a stand-in for the diversity of living things, you know, the actual biological diversity. And there have been some studies where people have looked at trace fossils through time. That's what this graph is showing here. And it was a lot of colorful squiggly lines. We don't need to worry about all the details of the color, but well, well, all the different ones. Let's just look at the Triassic into the Jurassic right there. Right around that time, there's a bump up in, in diversity of trace fossils, specifically in trace fossils in the continental realm, meaning on the continents. And by on the continents, that also includes in lakes, because lakes are on the continents. All, it's either continent or ocean. That's how this is divided up, continent or ocean. Streams are on, on the continents, lakes and ponds are on the continents as well there are these bumps up in insect diversity right there. 
or I should say trace fossil diversity, okay? And so we see that, that's exactly what Batois and Mangano say. There's a increase in trace fossil diversity. That suggests that there's an increase in biological diversity. Well, I argue that this increase in trace fossil diversity is the result of these aquatic insects getting into the lakes. And I, I see the second Q&A there, and folks, I will, I'm just about done, and I'm going to get to those questions in just a minute. So uh, happy to see those there. All right, another implication is that if Lunili pests in particular is correctly identified, it's the only fossilized water boatman trackway known, although that might have to be revised now. I should say it's the only fossilized water boat boatman trackway published on. Because as it turns out, I just got a, a couple of messages. Uh, and some people want to write a paper with me. They think they found some more. But here's, a, here's an actual water boatman from the Jurassic. Okay, so these insects were around in the Jurassic, and there's a potential trackway of them. And so here actually are some of those, those trackways that people had sent me pictures of. This one right here from the Jurassic of Utah. And there's another one from the Cretaceous, although this is not uh, gonna be a water boatman because look at what you see here. You see two sets of tracks instead of just the one, right? This is something slightly different, okay? All right, so I'm almost done and I'll be able to get to those questions. I just wanna make sure that I acknowledge the people who've made this work possible. So Gary and Lori Gollin were folks who allowed me to collect fossils on their localities. My, my dear friend and, and colleague, Bob Sproul, who collected some of these fossils, uh, unfortunately, he died in early 2018. Uh, Richard Sanderson and David Steer, they used to be at the Springfield Science Museum. They collect, they didn't collect, but they, they allowed these fossils that Bob and I collected to go into their museum. Haley Singleton, the Bineski, Susan Butts of Yale, all my students from Colin and also from other colleges, and also Sarah and all the folks here um, at the Jurassic Roadshow who've put this together, including the technical crew, everybody who's made this uh, possible. Uh, it's been, you know, uh, it's always fun to be able to do these sorts of things. So I've got just a couple minutes. I don't know, and Sarah, you can jump in here. I know I have until, Oh, it's at 2.30 my time, which is 3.30 your time. I don't know how long the Q&A goes after that. Well, let's just get going. And we've just got two right now. Yep. And more, we'll see. I think something, some also might come up on the chat. So I'll yep. keep my eye on the chat for you. Ah, Paul Olson. Paul just said something. Water boatman body fossils are the most common insects at the Solite. That's something that I wasn't aware of, and I'm wondering if that's actually something that has not been published on yet. Paul, I mean, you can address that because I've seen some papers from the Solite, but I haven't seen them discussed. I've seen more the the um, not the water boatman. My brain just completely shut down a second ago here. Um, giant water bugs, what I'm thinking of. Anyway, all right, that's good. I'm going to check that out. Thank you for that for that, and I better actually. I should save that, but let me get to the, the, the questions here. And I've got three. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, let's see, we'll go with the, let's say, Steve here. Hi, Patrick, can you slide rock face from only community college? I think the soccer field showed dark, thick brown layers with thin, light colored layers between. Why the color difference? Okay, their questions are popping in now. Very good. So why the color difference? Well, the color difference in the rocks, and, and you know, we've got some other people here who help us welcome to answer or address this as well, is you know, it's going to be reflective of what's going on in the environment. And so the dark black layers are essentially when the lakes are at their high stands. And what's going on with those lakes uh, <coughs> is that the bottoms of the lakes are relatively oxygen free. Uh, they might not be completely oxygen free, but they're low in oxygen, so there's not a lot of oxidation going on. And so organic materials to, is, is able to build up and, and reduced materials are also going to build up. Okay. In uh, the red environments or the red rocks, excuse me, uh, the organic debris is going to decompose pretty much entirely and the, irons, uh, the iron uh, that's in it ultimately uh, turns into iron oxides. 
essentially rust, which has that reddish color. So it's indicative of what's going on in the environment there. Hopefully that addresses it. If not, you know, put something else in the Q&A and I'll, I'll go uh, address that a little bit more. All right, Karen, is there evidence of plant herbivory by insects from this time period? Well, we don't have in the, in the way of body fossils, there really aren't any body fossils in the Hartford or Deerfield basins. I should say any, there's very limited. Um, but there's evidence of herbivory within insects as far back as at least the Permian period uh, that I'm aware of. I'm not an insect specialist and um, I haven't been up with the literature honestly as much as I should be lately. I've bought a house over the summer and I'm focusing on a million other things. But there is definitely evidence of plant herbivory by insects from even earlier than, than the Jurassic period, okay? Une unequivocal, unequivocal. Uh, so there's a, an extinct group of insects and my goodness, I'm ready for a nap all of a sudden. I give my lecture and I'm ready for a nap. Um, oh my goodness, I can't think of the name of them right now. Uh, very common in the Permian and they were a uh, primitive group of flying insects that have long, basically long proboscis, a long proboscis that was used for penetrating, uh, penetrating plants for basically pulling the juices out of plants. Uh, so absolutely, there's evidence of, of insect herbivory from even earlier than this time. Let's see, we've got Judy and there's, let's see, okay, this is, okay, I see what's going on, good. We're at Judy, so interesting. Will the PowerPoint be available? So I'm happy to make it available. What I will do is I will make it available as a PDF and I will forward that to Sarah who can then provide it as a link if you'd like, Judy. That's my pleasure to do, to do that. Okay, let's see. So I better make a note of that or I'll forget. We've got Alyssa. Why were the insects late to exploit lake environments? Was lake chemistry challenging? You know, actually, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. So it's a very, very good question. I'll, I'll just mention this too. Um, I'm kind of a novice when it comes to uh, studying insects. I've never, never taken an entomology class per se, uh, let alone a paleoentomology class. This was not something I anticipated that I would have gotten into, okay? Um, so, I don't know off the top of my head. I can think of some people I should ask and will ask. I love that question. I'm gonna just gonna do a screenshot of that because I'm gonna follow up on that myself. Okay, we've got Matt. Oh, I know you, Matt. All right, great talk. Have you considered underprint fallout for your single set of tracks? Could this be selectively removing a second set of impressions? That's a fantastic question. Okay. Um, Megasporoptera, Matt, no, that's not what I'm thinking of, but there's another group and I, oh man, it's killing me right now. Uh, thank you, by the way, for the comment about the talk, appreciate it. Uh, I have not really considered under track fallout for the single sets of tracks. And the reason I haven't is because a lot of these trackways are incre incredibly well defined. All right, they don't, they don't look like your typical under tracks, uh, but it's not, I, I don't wanna say that it's not possible. Uh, there are other trackways on these slabs. Um, you know, I'm trying to think if, I'm just thinking, trying to think when I've looked at these, there's only two slabs on which Luniuli pest occurs, by the way. Sorry about that. That's my email going off. I should shut, close that. Should have closed that already. Um, but there's no overlying letters, layers, excuse me, that we can, look at to see if there's extra sets of imprints. So it is possible. That's a good point. That's a very good point, Matt, that um, something I should think about and spend a little bit more time thinking about. But off the top of my head, I would probably say that I don't think that that's going to explain all of them. But of course I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure. You're welcome, Judy. Uh, Robert asked, can I share my contact email? You know what, I can, of course I can do that. And Steve, you're saying, could the light brown, yellowish beige colors be uh, ash falls? Uh, probably not so much in the symmetric uh, outcrop that I showed you, but I know uh, I, I will leave that to Paul to answer. You can uh, communicate directly with Paul. Um, he knows more about those ash falls than I do. So 
someone, I'm sorry to be punting that to you, Paul, hopefully that's okay. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna share my contact email right now with you folks. Let's see, I'm gonna annotate again. So if you'd like to contact me, which is perfectly fine, it's pgetty at colin.edu, okay? And Paul is also giving in uh, the, the chat here. So I'm sure everybody can see the chat. Go to his uh, chat message there. It's, it's p Olson at um, ldeo at Colum .columbia edu, And that's me in the red there. So the two of us, uh, I, I'm assuming, are happy to answer additional questions. If you, one other thing I'll mention um, for anybody, I mean, I've got somebody else from Connecticut who's been going back and forth with me finding trace fossils. Hey, what is this? What is this? I'm happy to help identify if I can. So feel free to contact me. Uh, you can also follow me if you want on social media. I'm on Twitter, for example. It's, um, I think it's at prof underscore p underscore getty. If you want, I mean, obviously you don't have to, but I post pictures, I try to keep it to just trace fossil stuff and other fossil stuff. But those are some ways of getting a hold of me if you want. I also have a website. The website is um, okay, and I've got a trace fossil gallery and stuff like that. But those are all of those are ways of getting a hold of me if you'd like to get a hold of me. All right, let me see. And I'm super excited about that. Thank you, Paul, for, for that uh, link. I'm gonna check that out. All right, anyway, so are there any other questions, folks? I appreciate the flurry of questions there. Thank you very much. Did you put up Paul's uh, contact info? So it's in the chat, but I'm happy to put it up to you as another thing right here. So Paul's, make sure I get this right, P-O-L-S-E-N, Where's at L D E O? Whoops, that's an O. Make sure I got that right. L D E O dot Columbia dot E D U. Okay, that should be his. Thanks, Paul. I see your, your message there. Okay, so yeah, he's recommending that I do it this way. I use the caps L D E O. Okay, so and that's Paul. <laughs> 